people are tired. What, what's that? What were your chin over there? Was that dude me or something like that? Dude me. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I won't mess you guys' music, all right, man? I promise you that. I'll try not to. So, I know some of you may be a little tired today, but I want you guys to really listen to how we wrap up and try to stay focused on me. Because I know, I know how it is. You eat breakfast. You know, we've spent a whole weekend full of games, fun, and I know we all went to bed at 12.30. So, I mean, uh, you know, in theory, we should all be wide awake, but because we all went to bed at 12.30. But, um, yeah, that's not true, is it? <laughs> but anyway, I want you guys to try to stay with me, try to stay focused, because it's really important, because everything we've been talking about this whole weekend, we're going to wrap it all up into this one session that we have. It's real important that you guys listen, all right? So I just ask for you guys for your patience this morning and to kind of knock off the tiredness if you can. If you see your friend fall asleep, shake them if you have to smack them, but in a loving way. You know, if you need to, you know, I'll feel free to strike them with the word. You know what I mean? You know, so that way they can go home and they can be like, you know, be like, well, son, what, the, what happened this week? You know, Dad, I really was stricken by the word this weekend. And it really hit me hard. So, anyway, here's that joke. How many of you guys like laws? Everybody's like, what? See, I like weird laws. Weird laws. Like, any of you guys ever read any of these, like, law books that are, like, these crazy, outrageous laws? I mean, give me a couple. What, Isaiah, what do you, what do you got? Off of a giraffe, crazy law. That's a crazy one. According, I love these apps. Thing. In New Mexico, idiots may not vote. There's one. Anybody else got a favorite one? All right, over here. Wait, you wait, wait. Hang on, wait, wait. Is that is that how we say like? What was that? All right, okay. What we got over here? In Georgia, it's illegal for a chicken to cross the road. It's illegal for a chicken to cross a road in Georgia. Crazy. Anybody? My app is not running. As quick as it normally does. There's some crazy. Laws. Anybody else got some crazy laws? Jordan? In Indiana, a woman over 300 pounds cannot ride a horse while wearing shorts. Okay. In Indiana, a woman over 300 pounds cannot ride a horse while wearing shorts. Okay. Any other crazy laws? You're not allowed to shoot rockets at birds in Florida. Apparently, in every other state, it's okay. Also, too, have you ever seen these signs, too, that say warning labels has been known to cause cancer in the state of California? So apparently, if you're in the, any other of the 49 states of the, the United States, you're okay. But if you're in Canada, that will cause cancer. I meant in Canada, no, in California. Okay, we had a weird law when I was stationed in South Dakota. It's still in the law books. It, it was a weird law that if there were more than three Indians on a street corner, you could shoot them. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy, right? There are some crazy laws. There's some laws out there, like, um, I think it's Illinois. Um, there's a weird law about, like, bathing. You can't take a um, shower on Sundays or something. There's some really outrageous laws out there, all right? In the Bible, believe it or not, there's some outrageous laws. Came up through Leviticus, and there's some awesome laws. I, let's see how you, know, you guys catch on all right, Leviticus 19.19. 19. It says, don't let cattle graze with other kinds of cattle. In other words, don't have different forms of cattle crossbreed. Another weird one on that was, you know, don't have a variety of crops in the same field. In other words, like you, you can't be, you have your corn with your beans, and you need to make sure that that's all separate. Don't wear clothes made of more than one fabric. I'm probably violating that one right now. I'm pretty sure. Um, there's multiple fabric, fabrics in this clothing. Um, guys, see, because it is no shade in the middle here, isn't it? Woo! Yeah. yeah we gotta, see, I'm kind of partially supporting it, as long as my wife will let me get away with this. I'm not sure how long it's going to last. She keeps tempting to cut it off while I'm sleeping. <laughs> as long as she only cuts this off, that's okay. You know, so, you know, like she's slitting, you know, that can be ugly. Anyway, but um, any person who curses at their mother or father must be killed. How many of you guys would be dead? Just you don't have to show your hands. So we guys are do it. How many of you guys would be dead if that happened? Um, all right, in Leviticus 20:10, 20, 
If a man cheats on his wife or vice versa, both the man and the woman must die. What? <laughs> that's, that's in the Bible. You're like, what? <laughs> Make sure, you know. <laughs> Um, how many of you guys, um, you know, you see the Psychic Network, network you see like those witches shows, these vampire diary shows and all of this. Um, in Leviticus 20:27, 20, it says physics, uh, I mean psychics, wizards, um, and witches are to be stoned to death. They'd be stoned to death. Do we have any PKs in here? All right, PKs. How many PKs are girls in here? <laughs> Jordan, put your hand down. <laughs> All right, you guys are gonna love this one. You're gonna love this one. If your daughter is a prostitute, if the daughter of a priest is a prostitute, this is actually in the Bible. She is to be burnt at the stake. <laughs> okay, and then um, Leviticus 21, 17, 18. Anyone with deformities, whether they be you know, like say a weird nose is blind, lame. They cannot go to an altar of God. And then Leviticus 24, 14 through 16 says, anyone who curses or blasphemies God should be stoned to death by the community. These are some pretty harsh laws, aren't they, when we look at them? Do we practice these laws today? It's changed quite a bit. There are weird laws, and we kind of see that in our own cities, states, government, federal laws and that. And what happens is there's laws that were written at a specific time where they had a purpose. Really worried about the one about the girl, 300 pounds, Florida insurance and that, how that law came about. But anyway, but there was a specific purpose. There was a specific culture that was going on, and that's why the, those laws were made. So we need to, when we look at the Bible, we need to make sure that, what does the Bible say about laws? And how does, because remember we talked about what does the Bible mean? It has one meaning, right? It says what it says. But we're getting ready to get into application today. And when we talk about application, we, got to, we have to make sure we're looking at what Scripture says, but taking on the context that it was written, and seeing if it applies. We're going to discuss a little bit about that today. Um, Leviticus 1, 11, 1 through 8. Turn there with me, please. Leviticus 11, 1 through 8, we're going to read. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to illustrate to you two totally different things that the Bible says. One from the Old Testament, and one to the New Testament, from the New Testament. I want you guys to stay with me. Don't get confused. Make it clear in your guys' minds. I'm not saying the Bible contradicts itself. By no means am I saying that. Because remember, we're talking about context, culture, and the era that was going on when things were written and what happened. So Leviticus chapter 11, and we're going to go with verses 1 through 8. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, say to the Israelites of all. Got to wait. Not there yet. You're not there yet. <laughs> Dave. My Dave. That 11 month? No, 11 chapter. <laughs> chapter 11. We're going to read 1 through 8, okay? It says, all right, is everybody ready? I'm almost ready. Do you get it? Got it. Good. All right. The Lord said, you guys are still asleep, I can tell you. You're kind of like, uh, someone, someone's just like, uh, get it. Uh, good. <laughs> the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Say to the Israelites, all of, of all the animals that live on the land, these are the ones that you may eat. You may eat any animal that has been has a split hoof completely divided and that chews the cud. There are some that only chew the cud or only have a split hoof, but you must not eat them. The camel, though it chews the cud, does not have a split hoof. It is ceremonially unclean for you. The coney, though it chews the cud, does not have a split hoof. It is unclean for you. The rabbit, though it chews the cud, does not have a split hoof. It is unclean for you. And the pig, though it has a split hoof, completely divided, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. 
Of all the creatures living in the water and the seas and the streams, you may eat uh, any of them that have fins and scales. But all creatures in the seas or streams that do not have fins and scales, whether among all the swarming things or among all the living creatures in the water, you are to detest. And since you are to detest them, you must not eat their meat, and you must detest their carcasses. Okay? So basically, he's saying there to Moses, giving them some pretty specific things of what they can and can't eat. All right? How many of you guys like bacon? Dude, we would all be in trouble, because I'm the same way. I love bacon. And, but according to that passage, we're not supposed to eat it. And some of you guys are going like, um, are you saying that like when we have that juicy BLT at home that like I've been sending? Well, no, let's turn to Acts chapter 10, 9. We're, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 10 and we're going to read verses 9 through 15. And we're going to read here, what we're going to read about is a vision that a man named Peter had. Right, so we just got done reading about all these animals that we can't eat, that we're not supposed to even touch, we're supposed to stay away from, you know, we're not even supposed to test their bodies. So, like, gives new the, the game we played, uh, hide the bacon, or what was that? Steal the bacon and that. You know, I mean, we, we would all be defiled if, if we were actually using pig parts and everything for it, just from Leviticus. But we get into... Acts chapter 10, and we're starting at verse 9, and we're going to read through 15. It says, About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal he was, was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a sh large sheep being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything on pure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So he gave instruction for Peter that it was okay to eat that stuff. Because if God said it was good to eat, it was okay. Now, the reason why I say that is when we're getting ready to go into the application process, what we need to look for when we talk about laws, does it apply today? And we need to look at also, too, confirmation in the New Testament. Now, I'm not saying that it don't really go away from here saying, oh, well, that means, you know, we don't have to listen to the commandments. You know, we don't have to listen to that because, you know, that, that's, I'm not saying the commandments were abolished by. I'm saying there are certain laws that no longer apply. All right? You guys with me? Yeah. Get it? Good. The Bible has one meaning, and we can gain many applications from it, guys. The application is simply this. The process of determining a biblical passage's relationship to one's own life. Application is the process of determining a biblical passage's relationship to one's own life. We could talk to many people in this room when we talk about applying it to their lives. There's some things that are going to be universal. There's going to be some things that are going to speak to different people if they're in God's word and praying about it. Because maybe personal experience, things they're going through in their life. Maybe it's trial, heartache, or maybe it's faith steps. So it's going to step out more and recognize it. The first thing you guys need to realize is it's important that we pray first, we observe first, and then we interpret first. Because until we do those steps first, those three, we can't do the fourth one of application. To truly understand how to apply it to our life, we need to understand it, what it means in its context. Okay? Some things to avoid. All right? Avoid imitating biblical culture. Exactly. Not every passage was meant to apply to believers all the time. Not every passage was meant to apply to all believers all the time. All right? I'm not saying the Bible's wrong. What I'm saying is, 
As we saw with some of the laws in Leviticus, they just don't apply today. It's different. The culture is different. Um, things have changed. There was reasons at that point in time when they did that. All right. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. There's hair requirements. There's robes. They would talk about robes in the Bible. Um, keeping a fence around the roof of your house. How many of you guys got a fence around the roof top of your house? Yeah, exactly. Not a standard in America. Um, now, if you go into the Middle East, their style of cultures, they use their roofs, tops, a lot different than what we do. They actually go on top of their roof. So it's more of a safety net than that. So it's understand that culture, understand what it means, and understand the apply. You guys with me? You understand that, that makes sense? All right, all right. Just, just making sure that you guys are getting what I'm saying. All right. So remember, key, I can't and state enough. The Bible has one meaning. It says what it says. However, it has multiple applications. One time in Sunday school, there was uh, a class that had about 30 kids, and um, they were dealing with, you know, junior hires, junior high age, and primarily 13-year-olds. And this teacher asked, was, you know, they were talking about Bible applications and how do you apply this to your life. And they were talking about the topic of siblings. And they're like, does the Bible have anything specifically in it that relates to siblings? One student quickly raised up his hand and said, oh, yes. And the teacher was just amazed. That's great, Johnny. What is it? You know, where is it at? He goes, well, you know, it's in Genesis. Really? Where? He goes, well, it's one of the commandments. Thou shall not kill. <laughs> so... Again, we can apply it. If you're thinking about killing your sibling, you know, you could apply the Bible principles. That would be a bad thing to do. So, <laughs> exactly. So, um, so application, there's two levels. We have what we call the surface level and what we call the level of principle. The surface level is just generalizations in how we can apply it to our lives. The level of principle is what is the principle that was taught and how do we apply that to our lives. So one is reading scripture and finding things and like, okay, I can apply this to my life. Another one is just, you know, diving in. We're learning a biblical principle, what it says, and we're taking that and we're applying that to our lives. Okay. So some hints for this. So how do we do this? Applying scripture correctly. There's some questions we've got to ask ourselves. Is the command inherently moral? In other words, in today's standards, would it be morally wrong to do it? We have, we have judicial systems that are set up. So probably if we took a bunch of people and just started killing them for adultery or, or for um, being a, um, um, the whole pastor or priest thing and if their daughter was just being going kind of crazy, that kind of be a bad thing, right? So morally, that would be wrong to do. So we don't do that. Um, so that's something that, you know, what are the laws in our culture? Is it inherently immoral to do it today or immoral to do it? Does the context give indications? In other words, does the context tell us how to interpret it? Sometimes the context tells us exactly by its meaning what it means, how it wants us to take it to heart. I'm going to give you an example here real quick. Um, another question I ask is, do we share comparable particulars? Okay, what's that mean? You're using big words, Jeff, and you're like putting them together. You know, what characters do you relate to? What life situations are going on in your life that stick out to you when you read this and you're like, oh, I feel just like Job. Or, oh, you know, you, you can go through and you can see that situation. That applies to me. So looking for those common situations that you can apply to, to your life and learn from. Another question is, is the command connected? Were they practices that were in the first century? Are they practices that are in today's century? In other words, you know, when we look at the first century, some of the things that went on in the early church and the culture, the Roman culture, whether it be, um, you know, the Ephesus, just there were different things that went wrong that they just don't apply today because it's a different time and age. And then the last thing that a couple questions ask is, what was the culture the author was writing to? And what was the author's ultimate purpose in writing it? Normally, if you write a letter, if you write a book, there's a reason for it, right? You know, we went back, going back to the love letters and that. If you're looking at the love letters that you write for your boyfriend or girlfriend, 
There's something behind it. There's something that you're wanting to get out. There's something you're wanting to share. You think it's so important that you want to write it so they have that to remember versus just being words. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. I gave you the other day a little bit of background on Ephesians. About the culture, what was going on, who was writing it, and why they were writing it. So we have that as a basis to work off of. But we're going to go into a little passage of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to start with verse 1 through 11. Get it? Good. All right, so starting in chapter 5, it says, Be imitators of God. Therefore, remember, always make sure you know what the there is for. Therefore, as dearly loved children and live, as, live a life of love, just as Christ loved and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor shall there be any obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them, for you once you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord, having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Now, I told you the culture yesterday of Ephesus and what was going on there. But we read, remember because I said sometimes the text will tell us exactly how to apply it? So how do we apply this? Look through that. Read, read through it. See, what words stick out to you guys? How do we apply this to our lives? How are we supposed to live? Imitating God. We want to make sure we're imitators of God. So what's that mean? How do we show that? Imitating God. Everybody's like, oh. Different characteristics. It gave us some good characteristics. What was it, guys? What were the characteristics it gave us? It gave us some negative behavior specifically of what not to do. What was it? Talked about sex, didn't it? You know, it, it's real. It's in the Bible. It's you know, it's a true topic that people struggle with. They talk about sex and how we're supposed to be. Sex is beautiful in the sanctity of marriage. How many of you guys are married? All right, you guys have a license that says it's okay with your wife. The rest of you, the rest of you, uh uh, you guys shouldn't be doing it. Flat out. The Bible says not to. What about coarse joking? What's that? What's coarse joking? It could be racist jokes. A racist joke is an example of it. What else? Dude, I know a lot of you are jocks, and I know you know what coarse joking is because I was a jock and I was in a locker room too. And there's a lot of coarse joking, vulgarity, words that shouldn't be used, things that are just very graphic. And you know what? It says right there in Ephesians, that applies just as much to the church of Ephesus as it does to us today. We shouldn't be doing it. Because what are we? If we're imitating God, we're hopefully imitating Him because we have Him in us. He lives in us. He resides in us. We're the light. People are looking at us. And that's why we should give up the ways of darkness. Some of you guys are like, well, you know, sometimes I struggle... Okay, recognize what you struggle with. If you're like, oh, you know, sometimes I just struggle with this and that's just hard for me. That's okay. But recognize it and do something about it. Because you know what? 
You guys are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. You're the seasoning. You're what people should be looking for to see. Because if we can't get excited about God, if we can't live a life that is different than the world, why be a Christian? What's it have to gain? If we can't truly get excited and show them that we're different by our passions, and we can show them that, you know, the things of the world are important, that we can abstain from sex, we can abstain from these bad sexual jokes, we can abstain from maybe being vulgar to our parents and the way we talk to them. It's our actions living out our faith. Your faith is not secured by your actions, but your actions are a result of your faith. You guys repeat that with me? Your faith is not secured by your actions. I said, your faith is not secured by your actions. But your actions are a result of your faith. Alright, but your actions are a result of your faith. It's important to understand that when we apply this. Because if we're just reading, there's a lot of stuff I read in school. And I'll be honest with you, I know it enough for the test. And I can get it done and great. Or maybe sometimes I memorize what it is. But maybe I don't believe it. And I'm not applying it. If we're not applying this to our lives, we're losing it. We're just reading. You might as well be reading the comic book. All right. So here's what I want you guys to do. We're going to break apart into groups again. I'm going to give you an assignment. Remember yesterday? What did we talk about yesterday? There's an assignment I gave you. What was it, Isaac? Who, what, where, when, and why, how. Who, what, where, when, and why, how. Good job. Yeah, observation. Exactly. So remember the observation process. What, does anybody remember the interpretation? I'm impressed, buddy. That's awesome. The interpretation, what that involved, what what that involved figuring out. Does anybody remember that? Cultural norms. Cultural norms, yeah. Finding the context, the genre, what was going on, what it meant, you know, what the writer meant, what the culture was, what the area was like, the region, the religions that were going on, the government bodies that were going in. Today's application, how we apply that description. We just talked about taking God's word and apply it to our life. We read John 13, 1 through 20. And we talked about the washing of the disciples' feet. Some of you guys were getting a little bit ahead of me, a little bit, and you guys were going deep, and I love that. That's great. But this is what I want you guys to do now. Break into small groups, and I want you to read John 13, 1 through 20 again. And I want you guys to come up with ways that you can apply it to your lives. That specifically, and when I say, remember, there's two ways we can apply this. We can apply this generally as far as how it applies to us as Christians. Or we can look at this, how does this apply to, how does this apply to Jeff? How does this apply to Isaiah? How does this apply to Jordan? How does this apply to Nate? How does this apply to Bo? Look at that. Because sometimes, let's face it, things are going to apply to us differently. And there's different things that we're going to catch as we read. So, all right? so take some time right now. Read John 13. Chapter 13, 1 through 20, and breaking those small groups. Let's go all groups of no bigger than five. No bigger than five. All right? Hang on first. Let's do this. Stretch up. Come on, you guys. Wake up. Wake up. All right? Come on. Let's